Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on theconsciousresistance.com and theseedsofliberty.com. So today we have Melissa Rakovich, who's a volunteerist anarchist from um, the state of Washington, um, okay. and she's a peaceful parent, aspiring acupuncturist, a doula, and a childbirth educator. And we're going to talk about um, the history of how she came to volunteerism and peaceful parenting, uh, as well as how, how we met because, um, you know, we've been talking you know, over Facebook for a while and um, and then we came to the idea that, you know, because she has two kids, like um, a 20-month-old and a, uh, is a three and a half-year-old, right, I think? Right. And, and so we we had the idea of starting a, uh, a peaceful parenting podcast ourselves called the Non-Aggressive Parenting Podcast, the NAP, um, and because I think, you know, on my show, I like I love to interview unschoolers and homeschoolers and peaceful parenting people, and and I think that subject is vast and deserves a podcast of its own. So I think uh, I think that'd be wonderful to do. So um, so yeah. So Melissa, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. It's nice to join you. Yeah, yeah, we've uh, yeah we've been talking for a while, so it's nice to finally uh, get you on the show, and uh, so you can meet everybody, and <laughs> uh, and also tell us tell them about you know what we plan to do together because um, I'm pretty excited about it. Um, like um, most of my um, most of my guests, I guess I guess because I have kids, so so my message is more geared towards you know parents and uh, you know and people who send their kids to government school, right? Um, since I'm around those kind of people, you know, homeschoolers all the time, so they're my genre <laughs> yeah exactly um so yeah so i think that's gonna be it's gonna be great but um but yeah so so get into please about your history uh, of uh you know how you came to volunteerism and uh and peaceful parenting let my uh, audience know all right so i uh found peaceful parenting first i uh wanted to be a doula and um which is a birth attendant and usually i was focusing on home births and so home births uh, kind of gives way to peaceful parenting. A lot of people who are into the natural side of birth um, also see parenting as a as a gentle um, transaction between a parent and a child. And so I was turned on to a book called The Continuum Concept by Jean Leadloff, which I think I mentioned to you mm. before. Um, <clears throat> and that started my journey to peaceful parenting. That was kind of the beginning of that rabbit hole. Uh, and so, and from there I, I trained as a doula and I started attending births and I talked to parents and midwives and they were all very familiar with the peaceful parenting, uh, concept. And then I read more books. And so, and, and the most interesting thing to me about it was when I would talk to people or when I would read up on it, um, it, it was very authentic, uh, to listen to. And it was something in me where I would nod my head, like that makes sense. I, I understand that. So, um, it was something that grew, the interest for it grew, uh, as I was learning it more and more. So, uh, and then by the time I had my daughter, I was 32 years old and I started the path at 19 years old. So I was well aware as to, uh, what I wanted, how I wanted to be a parent and, um, how I would implement, um, parenting and, and that sort of thing. So, uh, Pete, that's, that was my peaceful parenting, uh, path. Uh, and, um, and what happened was peaceful parenting is all about respecting children and getting on their level and communicating with them and reasoning with them and helping them through um, whatever they're going through. And a lot, oftentimes it's tantrums. That's definitely what my daughter's going through now at three and a half years old. She's got all these big emotions, but doesn't have the vocabulary just yet. And uh, I get a lot of criticism from my family, especially because I don't discipline her for it. But what I do is I get on her level and I try to engage her and try to work through uh, the situation with her and try to get her to understand it's okay to have these emotions, but this is how we can, um, you know, come to a conclusion that you'll be happy with. Um, so, and what I learned, what so it's basically non-authoritarian uh, parenting. And I started questioning more and more this is how I'm raising my children. How am I going to prepare them for the world outside when the world outside is, uh, <laughs> it's very entrenched in the state and very entrenched in rules and, and, and discipline and that sort of thing. And I started questioning more and more, um, what, uh, uh, anarchy really was. I definitely identified with anarchy, um, 
for the majority of my life, but I always thought that government was a necessary evil. I didn't think, I didn't see a way around it. And, uh, but the more I, I started questioning, the more I became more honest with myself about, well, just because things are the way they are, doesn't mean it's the right way or doesn't mean that I have to go along with it. And so it was really more a question of, um, figuring out how I want to live my life so that my kids see that I'm walking my talk. So if I'm teaching them, communication, if I'm teaching them to empower themselves and to govern themselves, which is what I really like to focus on, then I should be doing that myself. And that's what started me into anarchy. So. Great. Yeah, yeah. Me uh, as well. Um, I, I was introduced to a Stefan Molyneux video when my son was born in 2010. Uh, a couple of months later, my wife sent me a video. Um, the uh, I think it was like 17 reasons not to um, spank your child, something like that. Uh, Stefan Molyneux, and yeah, it really changed my life. It's the first time I saw a Stefan Molyneux video, the first time I was introduced to him, and and that's how I kind of got into volunteerism was through that. And um, my wife always always likes to brag. They see I'm the one that got you into this stuff, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is kind of true, I guess. But I just took it and ran with it, and I and I just you know it devoured like economic books, history books, and. Um, and you know, Larkin Rose's books and uh, various books like that. So, but the peaceful parenting definitely is central to me now because I really believe that you know, if we want, you know, it's one thing to talk to um, status, you know, people who advocate for government and to try to change their mind and get them to see the um, illogicality in their reasoning, but it's quite another thing to raise people peacefully and compassionately and morally and. Right. Uh, and teach them that there is really no such thing as um, as coercive authority, and it doesn't it doesn't deserve your um, obedience. And um, right, exactly. And once you know, because because that's the thing. One, one thing that Larkin Rose recently was talking about in his rant, which I love, is um, is that statism tries to make obedience a virtue. Right? It's like people want to do good. Right? Everybody wants to do good. Right? And so. The people who are, you know, like the tyrants and the people who want power, the sociopaths, they take that desire to want to do good and they pervert it and say, as long as you give me power, that's good. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Because you're following the rules and you're doing what you were told, which are things that I cringe at. And I, I try, I really try, unless it's going to physically harm my child, I allow them to figure out what works for them and, and figure out their own rules, you know, for the most part. So, and which is the opposite of um, the way that most, uh, well, especially our generation, I think that we were all raised with like a heavy dose of statism. And this is what you do when you listen to your teachers and you listen to uh, whoever's, whoever the authority figure is in your, in your situation. And, um, and you're never really taught I was never really taught to empower myself. You know, I was never really taught to think for myself. I was told what to do. And so, and that kind of just, it's like you're funneled into that thinking and, you know, and thankfully I started questioning early. Um, and thankfully a lot of people have been questioning it for themselves and that's why there's more than one of us around. Right. So, yeah. 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 Like you, my, my family, um, um, is not too, um, you know, agreeable to the way we choose to parent, and um you know my family as well as my 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 wife's uh family mostly are just her mother um but um but yeah it's 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 it is pretty difficult you know when when two ideologies clash um right. and, uh, and and you know you don't want it to be a conflict but they want you to raise your kids a certain way and you're like mm -hmm. no <laughs> i don't want right. to do that i'm sorry <laughs> and and don't take it as an offense if i don't because it's nothing personal against you it's just the ideas that I don't agree with. It's it's the principles that I think are flawed, right? I mean, everybody's yeah. everybody is imperfect, but you know, we, I think that I think volunteers um, are quite honest with themselves that um, that maybe they were raised in flawed principles and therefore they seek more logically consistent principles, right? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and that's just it, though. Is that you know, with my parents, I've had to actually tell them like because, or actually they've come to me and they're like, well, what was wrong with the way we raised you? You know? And I'm like, well, I actually could write a book on that, but I'm not going to get into that. And I'm, I've, I've forgotten about it. Um, and it, it's, it, this is not why I'm making this decision. I saw what you did and I, I don't agree with it. And, um, I also found my own truths as a parent. And so that's, what's important. It's not, um, you know, it's not, it's not, a, a 
it wasn't to um, hurt them by any means, but they do, they get defensive in a way. Like I've noticed that, that, that trend with parents are like, well, wait, why, why are you doing that differently? Mm-hmm. I thought we did a good job. And I'm like, well, you did what you <laughs> thought was a good job and that's, that's fine, but I'm going to try to keep pushing it, you know, make it a little bit more peaceful or make it a little bit more about the child, you know? So right. instead of, instead of the, the relationship, cause my parents are very much into being the authority, you know, and I'm the opposite. So I think they also cringe from that, but they don't, they also know they can't tell me what to do cause they never really could. So <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to do it anyway. So, um, but so definitely with my parenting, so, yeah, but they get they get they get defensive about it. And I think they, they do take it personally because they don't know how else to take it, you know, and mm-hmm. sometimes. So that's why I try to still engage and talk with them and as much as they'll listen. But they think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I mean, I was I was telling you recently that, you know, I was with a family member and um, and one thing she said was that um, if my well, like my daughter, my three year old, she fell and she was crying and my wife went to go pick her up and soothe her and everything. And then, and then she said, uh, this family member, she said, why are you picking her up? She's just trying to control you. You see, it's all about manipulation, right? She wants to just control you like that. <laughs> and it's just... Because uh, that's the agenda of a three, three-year-old, right? <laughs> Yeah, three year old, and and some people even go even way back into infancy. They like the same yeah. the, the same logic. Even an infant is thinking, right. "How do I control you?" <laughs> well, and that's exactly what my aunt told me when my daughter was born, and we never let her cry it out. She co slept with me, and I nursed her to sleep. And every time she would wake up, I would go in there. And my aunt told me once when I was going through the motions of doing this, she goes you know, she's just trying to manipulate you. Right. And I'm going, (laughs) she's three months old. What are you talking about? You know, but that's what she really believed. And that's Uh how she, like, she thought babies just, they're, they're crying to manipulate you. And I'm like, well, no, they're crying because that's how they communicate. So hmm, where's that disconnect? How how did you think that babies are, you know? So yeah, I definitely have dealt with that as well. (laughs) And one thing that, that I think of when people say that to me is how was your childhood? Right? right. How are you treated? Because because um, the way people were raised is is uh, determines in large part how how they view parenting. Right. Or how they yeah. how they view even relating to other people. You know, if you you know, right. if, if your parents were estranged from you, didn't listen to you, ignored you. Like, how are you going to think about how people are in general when you raise? Like yeah. That, you know, exactly. Exactly. So, so it's the, you know that's why it's so so important f- for you know people who who do peaceful parenting. I mean, and also unschooling as well or homeschooling, that you you know you're always attending to your child, and you're respecting their consent and what they want to do as much as possible. Of course, you know there's like you know people are like, what are you gonna do if your kid runs in the street? You gonna let him? No, of course not. <laughs> I, I mean, I mean you know we, I mean the way I approach it is like I know that I'm older, stronger, and bigger, but right. but. You know, to assert that and, and use that so I can control them and have them do what I want. That's not power. That's just like that's barbaric. That's savage. You know, that's manipulative. Yeah. You know, <laughs> that's what's manipulative. Right. <laughs> right. 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 And and so, right. you know, the harder the hardest part is to really figure out. All right. You know, what's your problem? Why are you having a tantrum? Why are you crying? And what can yep. we do to resolve that or find a solution? Uh, right. without me just telling you, you know, shut up, stop crying, calm down, right. you know? Um, and so, you know, talking to, to your kids and, you know, like the way I talk to my kids, I, I tell people, I like to imagine that I'm a peer, you know, yeah, like, like exactly. a, a friend, you know, right. like you wouldn't, or, or some people, you know, that I've interviewed, they say even a neighbor, you know, you wouldn't treat your neighbor, you know, if they, if your neighbor dropped a dish and broke it, would you, you like <laughs> yell at your neighbor and scold your neighbor, you know? And, Right, exactly. Well, and then think about it too. How long are you going to continue that relationship? I know my dad, I'm 36 years old. My dad still thinks that he can tell me what to do or lecture me, you know, and I'm like, (laughs) you know, I I like to think that, you know, if I'm raising my children to believe in themselves and let them be self-governing to a point, as long as they're not harming themselves, that they'll carry that through their life. I mean, because how long are you going to try to control your children? And then when they get to be an adult, uh, do you still continue that or are you going to move on and, and shift and allow them to be who they are? I, I've i always thought that it's important to just always allow them to be who they are and then they can naturally get into what they're supposed to when they get older and be and also be more self-sufficient for it as well. So Right, right. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. Like, um, you know, let them be free as often as possible. And, you know, I, I have a little group, a homeschooling group we meet up once a week. 
and we like to go to various parks and you know cook outdoors and then we go hiking and stuff and so i love to let the kids just play in the park you know jump on rocks and logs and stuff like that and just do stuff and let them go <laughs> just and, yeah. and and me not even look at them and because because sometimes when you're in the woods and you're looking at your kids you know the the uh, immediate instinct is no don't do that be careful you can don't yeah. hurt yourself put that down you know <laughs> right and so sometimes it's it's comforting to just say all right you go do or especially if they're with a lot of people and a lot of group you, you're like all right you're with a group just go and yeah and have fun you know <laughs> Yeah. And I find that with my children, like my daughter the other day, she got her Easter basket um, from her dad and she got back home and um, she was she had the Easter basket and she was like using the fake grass and just throwing it in the air and dancing underneath it. And my first instinct was like, I just vacuumed. What are you doing? No, don't do that. But then I have to stop myself. And I'm like, why am I stopping her? This is what a kid does. This is what they're exploring. This is fun for her. So I have those instincts sometimes where I'm like, "Ah, oh, wait. No, it's fine. You're totally fine. It's not going to kill anybody. It's going to whatever. Go for it. Have fun. You know. So yeah, a good yeah. a good uh, example. Yesterday, I was in a in a, a health food store after my uh, my um my my daughter's ballet class, and and then and then the kids were like, you know, they, I got them like a smoothie, and they were like asking, "Can I have a smoothie? Can I have a smoothie?" And I was like getting it slowly, and they said, like, "Can I have a smoothie? I want a smoothie." <laughs> and I was getting right. it slowly. I finally got it to them, and then the cashiers were watching me, and then the one cashier that I was I was that was checking me out, she said. Um, she's like, wow, that's amazing how calm and collected you are. <laughs> and, I'm like, and I said, I said, I said, you know what? Um, I think that when parents try to control their kids and what they do, I think that's exhausting. You know, when you're yes. always when you try to say, don't do this, don't do that, don't do, do it this right. way, you know, and you try to control everything. That's exhausting parenting. And of course, you know, that's when those parents are like, all right, just go to school. I, I can't deal with this. You know, I, you know, I don't want right. to be, you know, and I'm like, as long as they're not killing anybody, <laughs> that's what I told yeah. the woman. as long as they're not right. killing anybody, they're fine. I'm, I'm like, go ahead. <laughs> so I'm going to start laughing, but I'm like, or, or maybe making a mess, but <laughs> you know, as much as possible. Right, right. <laughs> Right. Exactly. Yeah. Or like I've, you know, take my kids to the park and, you know, they're running and they're doing whatever. And I like, and that's another thing too, is I, I put a lot of faith and trust in my children. I also let them fall. You know what I mean? So yeah. like I, I allow them to figure out things. I mean, for the most part, like if they're climbing on a play structure um, and usually they, they're climbing on play structures that are like well beyond their age group, but I allow them to do it yeah. and I let them experience it. And I kid you not, there are other children that are these exact same age and the parents are running over there and they're like, no, don't do that. Oh my God, you're going to fall. Oh, what are you doing? And this is going to wait. Right, right, uh, and right. I'm like, you're going to raise a hypochondriac, Like, let them <laughs> fall, let them explore, you know? Right, right. And so, um, yeah, that's definitely another thing that I like to do is just let, let them be, you know, let them figure it out, you know, mm-hmm. and that's what gives them the self-confidence. And in fact, I, um, my daughter and I were, we were going to the co-op and I was carrying my son and, um, she was running full force toward the door, totally slid onto the concrete right in front of the door, smacked her head into the glass door. Oh, she got up and dusted herself off. (laughs) And the two people that were nearby were like, so impressed. They're like, how did your kid just do that? And I'm like, cause I don't freak out. Like I allow her to fall. And if she needs me, I'll go to her. But for the most part, I allow her to react the way she needs to. And she just, you know that's part of life she gets up and she get, kept going so i was waiting for a big whale to come out of that one because that looked pretty brutal but i was impressed too i was like oh there she is she knows what she's doing all right you know so it was a proud parenting moment for me so you're saying she wasn't trying to control you then right is that what you're saying right <laughs> <laughs> not that i can figure out <laughs> not yet <laughs> yeah like um yeah i mean even those even the jungle gyms at like playgrounds like okay so my kids are used to playing outside in the woods on rocks on trees and all that stuff right yeah. so when they go to playgrounds and like yes. jungle gyms, which are really like artificial, like you know, play artificial play areas as opposed yeah. to the woods, th- yeah, they like 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 you said, they like master that and conquer it and climb everywhere you're not supposed to and and yeah. uh, and and like you said, like and also the other thing is like even if they fall there because most of the most of the ground is like padded or like special like foamy type right. ground, right? So right. it's even less of a risk if they climb there. And it's kind of, it's kind of funny that parents react like that. But I think yeah. that, um, I think that, you know, when, when we, you know, have that initial instinctual reaction, part of that is due to the way we were raised. Um, and, 
and I and I notice that myself constantly. You know, I can do a lot of things, and you know, I always try to be calm, not shout, you know, not yell. But you know, things happen, and sometimes I do. But I try, right. I try to catch myself, breathe, calm down. You know, say it's not a big deal. You know, and my right. wife, my wife catches me sometimes. I'm grateful, and I try to catch her right. too. You know, because yeah, we, you know, we're all raised in this authoritarian mindset, and and it's hard yeah. to break it. Yes, it right? is. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so uh, yeah, so as I think that uh, hopefully with our podcast that we're, you know, we'll be starting that we can, uh, you know, help people to navigate this, this um, interesting area of parenting, which, which is not like, I mean, I don't, I, I don't know how, how old, like true authoritarian parenting is. I'm not, I'm not really sure. Like, um, <laughs> but I don't know if this is a completely new thing. I'm not, I'm not even sure actually. Uh, is, is it like a, a popular in the tri- tribal regions or, you know, with like nomadic people? I don't even know. <laughs> well, one thing that was interesting that got me into peaceful parenting was that book, the continuum concept. And the basic premise of it was that, um, this woman was down in South America and she was, uh, um, with a tribe and, um, she was there for other reasons, but what she noticed was how harmonious the tribe worked together, how, uh, uh families were very much connected, how there wasn't a word for depression in their language, how <laughs> really? if a man were to fall, um, his, a woman would come up and give him a hug. And that wasn't like, you know, you're not being a man. Like, so she started noticing these trends in this tribe and they were incredibly happy. And so she started noticing, okay, this has got to, this has got to be from how they raised their children. Right. And so she started noticing that they co-slept and they breastfed, extended breastfeeding. Um, they carried their children. They, they loved them. They, they went to them if they cried. They, they, I'm sure they didn't, they probably don't have a word for manipulation either in this uh, tribe. Um, but, and, and so that was like the, the, it was a really groundbreaking book and it, she just, and it was one of many tribes, you know, that are, that are down there. Um, and I, I can't, I'm the, the name of the tribe is slipping me right now, but, um, I, I, what I've learned though, is that it depends on the culture, right? And usually tribes more act like a tribe as far as parenting goes. Um, so yeah, it'd be interesting to find out where exactly the authoritarian, um, parenting came from, you know, and what, what culture really, you know, so I, I'm, I would guarantee that it came from a culture that um, prided itself on war, you know. <laughs> right, and yeah, and, and also is closely associated with rise of nation states, right? Exactly, because, <clears throat> exactly. Because the the you know the children are the most impressionable. You know, that's the most impressionable years of our lives, right? Right. And if you can, you know, instill an idea into their brain that. Um, you know, that this is how you're supposed to act in society, you know, um, yeah. and it's hard to break that, you know, and then, and then on top of that, you put 12 years of government school. <laughs> and, right. And so it's really, really, you're, they're planting the seed deep into the yes. brain. So, um, you know, it's our job is to uproot that that authoritarian status seed, because, um, you know, as we know, that you know, statism, or more, more, more specifically, the belief in authority, because right. you know, basically, that's what government is—the belief in authority. That some right. people, some people have uh, you know, superhuman rights or are exempt from morality uh, than other people, and um, and when we do that, you know, that's really the root of pretty much <laughs> the most horrific atrocities in history. Yes, exactly. Well, and that's interesting too. Like the 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 seed, um, you know, when when children go to public school, it's it's driven in that much further. And that's why when parents discover that they're going to homeschool or unschool their children, there's a there's a process when you take your children outside of public public school, you de-school them. So you're yeah. you before you get to unschooling or homeschooling, and it's something that I've heard. Um, quite a bit in the unschooling community is you allow them to deprogram from what they were force fed and what like, and, and what they, what they were taught to believe as authority. And you allow them to, you know, let that um, dissolve. And then you can allow them to get back into who they were and into unschooling and their interests and that sort of thing. So I think that was, that's a really interesting thing to think about too, um, is the fact that there's a, you have to deprogram. Can you, can you go into your history of, uh, of, of how you know your government school experience went and and why you decided to to unschool or homeschool well okay so i uh i was a product of divorced parents who both individually moved a lot and so i went to 15 different schools by the time wow. i was four, by the time i was 14 oh my God. and um so I, it was about a school a year or two to three schools a year um i i kept moving to and at the age of 15 i decided you know what 
this is ridiculous. I already read Shakespeare at the age of 11. I was re I read The Godfather at 13. Like I was reading all these books that were well, <laughs> you know, advanced for what my my age group was or my grade group. And I remember a teacher telling me that I shouldn't be reading those books because I, I'll get bored in class. And so, <laughs> you know, like that, there's logic, right? Um, so I just decided like, you know what, I don't need this. And I decided to leave school at 15 and I never looked back. So, wow. um, yeah. Yeah. So that's, so I, and maybe it's because I moved a lot and maybe because I went to so many different schools and, um, but when I think back on schooling, I, my stomach hurts. Like I, I just cringe. I, it just seems like a, someone equated public schooling to, um, it's basically prison for children. And that's exactly what it felt like. You're all, you're all supposed to be, um, you know, you're supposed to stand in line. You're supposed to sit down. You're supposed to do exactly what you're told every second of the day. And if you do anything that resembles being a child, you're going to get punished. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and that always stuck out to me. Like I, I always, I remember being fearful of, doing anything out of line because you would get punished, you know, and I actually went to schools that where they actually were allowed to spank you, um, huh. or hit you. Wow. Yeah. So that was like, that was another thing. Um, so yeah, so I, you know, and then I, as I got older, I, um, I just realized how much it, like all that schooling didn't do anything for me. Once I left school at the age of 15 and I went on my journey of life. I just like, I, I learned so much more that way. I was learning what I wanted to learn. And about, uh, about 10 years after that, I heard the word unschooling and it was from a, a home birth that I attended. And, um, the parents had already had like four other children and they were unschooling their children. And I remember having a conversation after the baby was born, uh, cause I was just so fascinated with how these children were learning or learning, you know, or just being essentially is what it is. And, right. and so back then I, I got into the term unschooling and again, when, uh, with the parenting, with the peaceful parenting, when, the more I learned about unschooling, the more it made sense to me. And I, even to the point where I thought, Oh, well, I wish I had done that. I wish I was allowed to explore my interests. You know, I wish I was encouraged to, you know, get into what I wanted to get into. And so, um, and then I just knew at that point, like, there's no going back. Like, I, I wasn't going to send my children to school at that point if I if I were to have children, you know. And so, and then now after having children and I see them and I see how, you know, even at their ages that uh, my son is 20 months old and my daughter is three and a half, we're unschooling. We've been unschooling since they've been born. Whatever they're interested in, we encourage, we, we, we try to facilitate a process so that they can learn what they want to learn or create what they want to create. And that's basically what unschooling is. And and that makes it more and more as we're doing this, it makes a lot more sense um, to do unschooling because it's just going to go flow along with their life and they're just going to discover themselves better and have more autonomy and more confidence in who they are. So that's kind of where my whole schooling and unschooling theories came from. Great. I, I, um, I was at a, um, a car, uh, uh, what are you saying? like a mechanic getting my oil changed yesterday. And uh, it was like, you know, you have to wait inside of a, um, it's like a convenience store. And my kids right. were just having fun, just running around, you know, laughing with each other, run, you know, running after each other and just laughing. And and one thing that I noticed with my kids is, um, I don't know if, if uh, this has to do with the, the way I parent or the way I raise them, but they always bring smiles to other people's faces. I don't know if every, everybody's kids do that to people, but my kids definitely do that. Like when, when my kids come, like people start smiling and they just laugh and and I think part of that is due to the fact that they don't, um, they don't, uh, how do you say, um, recognize authority, right? They would say hi to yeah. anybody. They would go up to anybody and talk. You know, my daughter says hi to anybody. <laughs> yeah. And, and so that's part of it. And and so I was talking to this this one woman was there, and she I looked she was looking at my kids and she was smiling. And then I started, I started talking to her and, and I found out she has kids. Uh, no, she has one child, like a three three year old. And, uh, and, uh, you know, she works at some corporation and, and then she said her husband works at, um, he's a counselor in a public school. And then, and then I, and then she asked me what I do. And I said, oh, I'm an acupuncture herbalist. And I also, I'm a homeschooler with my kids. And then she said, oh, I have heard about that. That is so good. She's like, all the time I've been listening to public school and how bad it's getting. You are doing such a great job. <laughs> and it was very right. encouraging. And she's like, I think I'm going to get into something like that. But she's like, she was thinking of more Montessori. I'm like, yeah, my wife's thinking about that. But that's like out outrageously expensive. <laughs> I just yes, don't, think it's, it I don't, think it's, I don't think it's worth it. Um, right. 
<clears throat> but what it, what really amazed me was that I just brought it up and she just like it all this stuff. I didn't have to like and convince her about it, you know. Right. But she brought up. She's like she admitted that things were going wrong and and that she wouldn't want to put her own child in in public school. And I said, yeah, right. I mean, sometimes you know you look back at your own experience in in public school or, or government school, and and how can you if you didn't enjoy it, how can you sanely admit that you would put your own children in in government school you know if you didn't enjoy yeah. yourself if it was a miserable dreadful experience what kind of a person would you be to say my kids have to go that and endure that as well well that's part of the author authoritarian um belief is that well this is what you do this is what you do with your children because that's what was done to me and that's you just funnel along through that train of thought and you just do it because it's it's apparently it's a rite of passage right like well everybody school sucks for everybody so right, right, you know right. it's gonna suck for him too and they just have to deal with it because that's right. the real world right like right. i've heard that so many times and it's like but you have a choice you don't right. have to put your child in a horrible situation like you can actually change that like so it, it's interesting a lot of people just kind of give up on that like well I did it they're gonna have to do it you know so it which is unfortunate but it is interesting I've had many conversations with people where they they go oh yeah public school like they get it you know yeah, <laughs> they yeah. understand how bad it is and um which it's not that much different than when I talk to status it's like uh or you know everyone who believes that government is necessary they will acknowledge at media that uh, that government produces mediocre at best services right mm -hmm. uh the only thing that they really excel at and the only thing that the government's really good at is war right so but and even status will admit that you know but but they still cling to but we got to do it because that's what we were told and this is you know what i mean so it's kind of similar thinking it's a similar process to me anyway. yeah the the, uh, the appeal to antiquity <clears throat> logical, right. logical fallacy you know it's been done this way so my right. grand, my grandparents did it my parents did it we got to right. do it our kids have to go through it and, yeah and um you know, I mean, that's exactly how tyranny happens. That's exactly how, you know, injustices are allowed to happen is by people yep. just passively submitting and accepting that, you know, if everybody's doing it, then I got to do it. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. And and it's it's just so sad that, you know, people, you know, they would rather be, I guess, um, accepted in the mob then stick out right. and, and stand up for something moral or stand up even for their own children. Like, like people, yes. some people really, really don't even have a backbone to say, I no, I'm not going to subject my child to that. That's, that's completely horrible. That's a big waste of time. It's going to destroy their creativity, their imagination. They're never yeah. going to get the, those years back, you know? Right. And, exactly. And, and few people have the courage to do that because, because, um, you know, they're afraid to stand out and say, Oh, you're homeschooling. Oh, you're one of those people. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, and then one of the things too that I see resistance with like, you know, why well, I, I got to do public school because we we both me and my, you know, the partner or the father or the mother or whatever, they both have to work, right? And right. Yeah. Um one thing that I've I've always like thought about, I'm like, yeah, but if you really sat down, if you really looked at it, like is there any possible way that if you really wanted to do homeschooling, if you really didn't want your children in public school, I bet you could figure that out. I bet you could figure out some sort of schedule, some sort of something that you could work to provide that environment for your child and you just alter your life a little bit. Um, that's exactly what I had to do is change up what I'm doing, you know, to make money or change up what I'm doing with school. And, you know, and, and so, but I, and it, it can be stressful and it can be hard, but to me, all of that is an investment into raising my children and allowing them the unschooling experience. So, and, you know, I mean, maybe not everyone's able to do that. I'm not saying that, but I think, um, I think it's easy to chalk up you know, that they're just going to go to public school because, well, it's free daycare, right? You know, so, <laughs> right. you know, essentially. <laughs> yeah, when people when people tell me that, um, you know, uh, we have to do that because we need two incomes, you know, I say that, um, you know, you have to make a decision in your life. What's important to you, right? Right. Is it important to maintain the lifestyle as you have currently had it um, with two incomes or is it important <laughs> that your kids' uh, needs – and desires are catered to, right? And and whatever whatever you choose, you model your life around that. You make it work, right? So if you say my kids are of the utmost importance, 
<clears throat> you're gonna you're gonna do what you can. You're gonna make sure that that's a reality, right? Yeah, there's no exactly. question. There's no question about it. No question at all. If that's we, if that's the decision you make, you're gonna make it happen. <laughs> that's, exactly. That's it. That's it. That's all I tell people. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so it's not um you know it, it it's not a matter of money. It's more like you know I tell people this like we live in New York right now. And, um, you know, if we need to, we're going to move wherever we need to move to to make it right. happen. If we can't afford to do it here, if it's, you know, too expensive, we're going to move because our right. kids are more important than where we're living. <laughs> right. Exactly. You know, so. Yeah. So, yeah, I think I think people have to get their priorities straight in their mind first, you know. Uh, yeah. And, and also, I think people who say that excuse don't really understand completely the damage that government school does and what yes. um, unschooling offers, right? Because, yes. um, because you know, it's, it, you know, here's another interesting, um, uh, um, you know, argument or thought process that I go through with, uh, with some people is, um, you know, what bureaucrats are trying to do by saying your kids need to go to government school is they're saying this is the information you're going to need to learn for the next 12 years, 12 years into the future, this is the information you're going to need to learn to get a job. <laughs> right. and, then, and then if you go three more years after that, let's say 15 years, this is the information you're going to need to know for 15 years in the future when you get a job in 15 years. This is what, gonna, what they're going to need, what they're going to want, right, your employers. And I'm like, now, now you look back, um, let's say 20 years um, when the internet was just getting started and let's say a few more before he was even born, before anybody knew what the internet was. Now, yeah, right. those kids in public school, <laughs> the, the people, in, they're like, this is what you're going to need to learn in 15 years. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> How do you know? Basically, you what they're doing is that. what right. they're basically yeah. doing is they're, they're predicting the future. They're saying, right. we know what you're going to need in 15 years, which nobody knows. Nobody. Right. It's impossible. Right. So the only way that you can ensure that your kids are going to thrive is that you give them the freedom to pursue whatever they want to pursue. And by definition, that will be what they're most skilled at and most likely to make a business at. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And well, and that, and then again, it goes back to giving them giving them the encouragement to be self-governing, giving them the encouragement to, to be their own person and be free from authority, you know, and that's what and schooling really does is that if you're encouraging their passions and their pursuits, they're going to learn what they want to learn and they're going to learn something. A lot of people think that unschooling is they're not learning anything. And it's like, no, that's not what that is. What it is, is it's pursuing what they personally want and what can be better than that. And why would you want your child to be put in a, a cookie cutter situation where all the children are learning exactly the same thing, what they're supposed to be learning. And usually it's below their, the level of intellect that they have, you know? So, and they're going to get bored and they start acting out and then there's discipline problems. And then, you know what I mean? It's just like this crazy cycle. And it's like, if you, we just allow children to be what they are and it's a short time, it really is only a short amount of time. Um, they'll be able to figure out what they want to do and make their own decisions and, and have, uh, just have the self-confidence through all of that. So, which is the best thing I could ever give my children is allow them to have self-confidence, allow them to learn their life lessons and lovingly guide them along that, you know, as a peer, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. 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 Government is a, you know, the, the idea of government is a one size fits all solution, right? Anything, right. anything that, you know, government tries to do through their coercive laws is always a one size fits all. No questions right. asked, mandatory, compulsory, you know, and, yeah. and, and some people, you know, some people object whenever I talk about government and they're like, you like to use the word force a lot. I, I'm not really comfortable with this word force. <laughs> <laughs> well, what would you call it? I know, you know? Right? <laughs> and, and I'm like, well, well, and you know, if we're talking about government school, I'm like, I mean, have you heard of truancy laws? Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Like... Or not only even that, but there's a, there's such an infringement on the way you parent. Like, say, if you wanted to take your child out of school to go to on a vacation, and it wasn't during vacation times, uh, there's a lot. You're met with resistance from the school. They will either tell you that that's not allowed, or that they're going to dismiss your child from that school, or they're going to get expelled. I mean, which is 
nuts. Like, wh- mm. how how did they ever get the authority over your children over you? You know what I mean? Like, th- there's a lot of infringement that's that's happening with the authority in the school toward your child. You know, they want their child to learn this way. They want your child in school these days, no matter what. So whatever you've got going on in your family, it's not acceptable, right? So that's another aspect of that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, the, um, you know, first when you're young, you know, you, you obey your parents, right? They're the first authority and you obey the teacher. They're the other authority. Yeah. Then you obey um, the, the police officer and you obey the politicians. <laughs> you know, the obedience right. just never ends. <laughs> right, or, exactly. or, you, or you get punished, you know? So it's the, uh, it's the appeal to force or the appeal to the stick, uh, logical fallacy. It's like, I can hurt you. That's why I'm right. <laughs> exactly right? that's basically what that is yeah i can, I can <laughs> exactly. tase you i can cage you that's that means right. i'm right might makes right right that's completely the uh <laughs> the so idea. maybe it's not that the word um you know the, the the use of the word force isn't what makes people comfortable it's the reality you're bringing to the situation right so they're having to acknowledge yeah government is force because you can't really argue against that you know i mean if you do you're not going to use anything valid in my opinion you know what i mean like it is force if you look at it so um and 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 people do get uncomfortable with that but i think it's because they get uncomfortable with the truth right so <laughs> that reminds me of a recent uh largan rose rant where he says uh it's basically titled uh why you should make lefty hippies guilty <laughs> feel guilty <laughs> and he's like just 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 because what you said if most most lefties like especially people who support bernie sanders um you know they say well you know we're government is us government is society you know we have right. chosen we have chosen this for us so you know we are in control <laughs> you know this kind of all this kind of crap and and i'm like I'm like, really? Did you sign the, any? The, did you determine how much money was going to be printed a, a couple of months ago? Did you determine which <laughs> which which banks were going to be bailed out? Did you? Right. <laughs> did you determine which which countries to invade? Which countries to drone bomb? <laughs> did <you>? Yeah. <laughs> really? Exactly. We are the government. <laughs> right. Exactly. And, uh, and that's when uh, that's when the the argument gets invalid, right? Because it's like because you know they didn't sign off on that, and then they go, well war is inevitable or this is inevitable or that's what government does. So, but then it isn't you that's in control. So what are you doing? You know? Right. Right. It's this, it's completely mushy headed idea of we, right. Um, yeah. And it completely discounts the, the individual completely. Uh, I mean, I understand people want to be part of a group, but once you're part of something that's just so um, monstrous and, and just um, horrific, you know, yeah. And, and, you know, the, the military industrial complex. And how could you be pro- like, it's like, well, you know, you need to pay your taxes because how else are going to road, you know, we're going to have roads and bridges and tunnels. I'm like, I'm like, who ca- you're worried about? There's like there's like children and weddings there's and people dying, dying like, right now like, because of U.S. foreign policy. Like, and you're worried about the pe- fucking roads. Pe- I'm people sorry. are worried. <laughs> people are worried, like walking to work that they're going to get a hellfire missile is going to explode right next to them. And right. you're worried about it. <laughs> you know? I mean, how could you forget that? I don't understand how people can forget that. Um, and it's important that we, that we bring that. And actually, I don't know if you, you checked out my recent video with, um, that I posted with Daniel Hawkins, but he said that there's an app called metadata that, right. that have you heard about this? I have not, and I didn't check out the video yet. But no, okay, tell yeah, me about yeah, it. there's an app called Metadata, which um, you can put on your phone, and it alerts you every time there's a new drone strike. Oh wow! And it even tells you how many people were injured or died. Right. And sometimes it even tells you if there were children involved. Oh my god! And right. I'm like, wow! <laughs> I don't even know how they get that information, but can you imagine that? Like how right. like an app like that and I mean, maybe that would hit home. Like, if you if somebody were to say, "Well, how well, how do we have roads?" and you just you just be, take out this app and you open it up and you're like, um, "You want to take a look at this?" Yeah, exactly, exactly. But you know, but and they're not going to, and they don't want to, you know, and and because a lot of people they feel helpless when it comes to the United States government, and they don't understand that all you have to do is stop validating it. Really, right, I right. mean. I stopped validating it a long time ago and I don't, I don't, I don't agree with what they've been doing for a long time, if ever, you know, and I, and, and, um, but they think that's the difference is like when I talk to people who are, um, heavily statist and I'm heavily anarchist, uh, 
they think that you're not voting is not doing anything. Kind of like unschooling is not learning, right? It's it's a similar <laughs> right. concept where yeah. they go, oh, well, what you're doing is you're just an armchair anarchist and all you're doing is espousing your theories. And I'm like, <clears throat> even if even if that were the case, at least I'm being honest. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? Right. Like, at least I'm the one that can acknowledge that government doesn't work. They're committing mass murder as we speak, as mm-hmm. we're having this interview. Mm-hmm. So how can you sit comfortably with that? Well, and then I hear things like, well, but free college or this or that. And I'm like, but that doesn't, so that justifies all these people Uh, dying right now. You know? So what I get back to constantly is uh, I just, I, I'm not going to believe in that authority anymore. And I don't, and I don't acknowledge it. And I, I am not a part of that death trap, you know, and I'm going to navigate my children as much as possible outside of that. I actually consider myself an outlaw for a reason. You know, I've always said that I was an outlaw and I've pretty much lived a lot of my life that way. And because I'm outside of the law, I don't break the law i'm outside of it i live outside of it and that's how i raise my children to be anarchist outlaws like their mother so (laughs) and i'm sure you'd be proud of that too (laughs) very proud yeah yeah so yeah and and another thing to get back to the to the uh, government school conversation is how how do they get people to sign up for the military right and the best way and the easiest way is to do it like 12th grade maybe even 11th grade i don't even know that they start recruiting them and all the propaganda and stuff but you know with the rotc and crap like that and they just it's the easiest way you know raise an authoritarianism go into another authoritarian environment it's such a smooth transition um yeah and and you just take kids i think i forget where i heard this but um that the the rational thinking mind is not fully mature until like the age of 25 right so if you can get people before then, you know, which is why, you know, it's so important to get them at that age into the military. It's it's an outstanding success rate for them, like to get mm-hmm. people recruited. And before right. they even know what they're doing, like they're in there and they're bombing these people and then kicking in people's doors and raids and and surveillance and all this kind of and reconnaissance missions and crap. And they don't even know what they're doing. They're like, what am I doing here? But yeah. and, and then they, they, they wake up and they're like, I just committed atrocity yeah. and evil. In the name of, uh, you know, my government. And uh, right. I thought I was doing good, but I wasn't. And, you know, then they come back with PTSD. And it's just a, such a tragic situation. Um, and, you know, it's like, it, it, what, what do you call that? I don't know, a human death machine or something. It's just disassembling human beings. Um, and, and people cheer for this stuff, you know. Like, look how popular, like, this election is becoming. Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump and, oh, <laughs> <laughs> and the other one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so let's uh, not say your name. <laughs> right, right. Uh, but I mean, all all of them. Like, uh, I mean. So and and then you know, people. I don't know how people think. Like, as long as we get the right person in office, then things right. will get better. We just need, we just need the right person to hold the ring of power. Right. Right. Then people. You know, Yes, exactly. And what's funny is that all the candidates are the same and everyone on either side is going, oh, well, my candidate's better because of this and this and this. And it's all about the same issue, right? Like it's all about both sides are heated about guns. Both sides are heated about abortion. Both sides are, you know, it's all they all have their opinions. And and but all that does is create a division, right? Like <clears throat> and that's what that's for. In fact, I had a conversation with a friend a couple days ago and, and she, I was telling her about how I was explaining anarchy. And I said, she was saying, well, I guess I have to vote for Bernie. I'm like, why, why do you have to vote for anybody? You know, she's like, well, he's the better option. I'm like, no, he's not. She's like, well, I wouldn't want Trump. I'm like, you want to let me tell you something. I can respect Trump a lot more than I do Bernie. You want to know why? Because at least he's honest about being violent toward people. Bernie Sanders has authorized, um, m- funding for the military throughout the course of his entire uh, political career. And he has, uh, you know, and and a lot of people don't realize that they think he's anti-war. He's not anti-war. He's authorized funding for wars, you know, or whatever military spending is happening. And so I had that conversation with her and I said, I trust, I would, I would, I would have more respect for Trump because at least he's blatant about being a warmonger. Whereas you guys are fooled into thinking that Bernie is not a warmonger. And she stopped and she said, Oh, (laughs) <laughs> well, yeah. So what am I supposed to do? I'm like, don't validate the state. That's what it comes down to. Like, and, and nice. she was like, she goes, yeah. She's like, I've been wanting to talk to you about this for a while. Cause we've known each other since we were 15. So 21 uh, years ago. Uh, okay. Yeah. And, um, and so I was like, and, and then she came back with, well, Obama is better than Bush. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> 
there are more countries being bombed. You know, he just continued Bush's policies. It's the same thing. It's just right. a puppet in, right. in, in, in this, in the pseudo thing, you know? So, um, so yeah, so, I, but I got her to stop and look at it. I'm like, even if she said, well, <laughs> do you think Obama hasn't done anything for the United States? I'm like, I don't care if he gave everybody a house and money and whatever, it doesn't justify what he's done in the Middle East. It doesn't justify all the deaths that are on his hands. It doesn't justify all the drone strikes that he's authorized and all the invading of other countries. It doesn't It doesn't matter what he's done here or what he's given you. Like you gotta stop looking at it from that perspective. We gotta look at this as humanity, not, um, you know, just looking at your, um, you know, just looking at your own country. You gotta look at it as like the world, like, you know, and that's one thing too that, um, when I talk to people and they're worried about climate change, I'm like, I'm not worried about climate change. <laughs> Humans are going to kill each other faster than anything. The earth <laughs> will true. recover. I, I have full belief that the earth will recover. No problem. Like it'll get back. It'll cleanse itself and humankind will be gone. But the, the biggest, the biggest problem right now and the biggest death, um, the cause of death right now is humans. Right. We're killing each other exactly. faster than anything. <laughs> so I think we need to like reshift our priorities and focus on that. You know what I mean? So yeah. One thing that, um, Murray Rothbard did for me is realize the um, the political euphemisms that permeate um, yeah, politics and government um, that really serve to mislead people into believe into understanding what's really happening. Like you know, right. you can call it you can call it um, currency creation, right? They call it currency creation, but it's really counterfeiting. Right. You know, you can call it the war on terror, but it's really mass murder. <clears throat> you know, right. you, you can call it. Uh, taxation, but it's really theft, right? <laughs> you, know, you know, and it's important. And so, another euphemism that I think we we should dispense with to help people to understand what's going on is <clears throat> you can call it. Uh, they call it the president of the United States, but I, I would rather call it the mass murderer. <laughs> yes, <States>. exactly, <laughs> and, exactly. And and it's kind of funny that um, it's like um, you know, murderers, ma you know, serial killers are in prison for like life. Right. Right. <laughs> right. right. That guy's a serial killer. Look at him. He killed and he mangled people and he cut out their body parts and put them in his wall and everything. Right. Right. But vote for Obama. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and exactly. <laughs> vote for this exactly. candidate, vote for that candidate and the wars will keep coming. The invasions mm -hmm. will continue. You know, right. the, um, <clears throat> the drone strikes will continue. And yes. people, you know, they don't see the they don't see the disconnect there that that you know war is organized mass murder, right? right. And you know, one of my favorite um, um, Voltaire quotes is um, 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 murder is um, is unacceptable unless it's it's um, brought about by the sound of trumpets, right? <laughs> you know, and right. and it completely puts it into perspective, so. Yeah, exactly. Well, and I, but I'm thinking back to the 1984 book where, you know, the war is peace, freedom is slavery mm. thing, right? Like that's people, people actually believe that now, mm. you know what I mean? They actually believe, well, in order to have peace, we got to bomb the, bomb the hell out of this group of people over here, right? Which where, where did that, how, how does that make sense to right, you as a right. human being? How, you know, <laughs> so. Yeah, that reminds me of the George Carlin quote, um, fighting for peace is like screwing for virginity. <laughs> Right, pretty much, <laughs> exactly. It's like uh, I, I love I love when uh, Adam Kokish. I don't know if you've seen any uh, much of his videos, but he's he does a great job. I have the, a few, the, yes. the man in the street videos where he talks uh, to people and and just uh, deconstructs their arguments very calmly, very coolly. Um, right, you know, it's like um, like after the American Sniper movie came out, he was talking to people about that, and and they're like, he was a wonderful man, you know, and 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 it's like, well, um, what was he doing over there? Oh, he was protecting our country. You right. defending our country, really? You defend by going across an ocean. That's how you right. defend. That's how you defend. Right. Exactly. <laughs> you know, it's like these people were terrorists. Are you sure about that? How does he know? Because he was told that you know these people you have to kill. And how does he know? Like, where does he get his information? And you know, maybe these people were just attacking them because they were in their country and they were being invaded by yeah. foreign people. You know. Right. Like who wouldn't want to defend your family and your property when other people are invading? Exactly. You? How dare they? How dare they put up a fight? How dare they not let us bring in democracy and 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 prop up our own dictators for our own personal use? How dare those people? Right. <laughs> right. Right. So so you know you know bringing it full swing around to what we're talking about is you know by raising our kids the way we do by raising them with a sense of you know self reliance self confidence 
um, peacefully, compassionately, rationally, morally. It's so important, the moral part. <laughs> right. Because once you understand how to live morally, you know, you don't need laws. You don't need regulations to act, right? Because your morality should be your inner um, law, basically. That, that should be the rule that you live by, your own conscience, you know? And, and for most people... I think there, most people's consciences are intact. There are a certain subset of people that are sociopaths and, you know, really do not have a conscience or morality. But I think for yeah. the most part, you know, I meet people on the, all the time on the street when I'm out with my kids and, you know, nobody wants to kill me. Nobody wants to rob me. Most, most people. <laughs> um, yeah, but exactly. So, well, so go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, even still, even, you know, that's laws are completely useless. They're completely useless because when you think about it, prohibition doesn't work. I mean, if it did, then um, murder and rape would have ceased to exist when we made it illegal in this country. But the thing is, is that those people, whoever, whoever wants to commit, you know, whatever crime they're going to commit, they're not going to go, oh, but it's against the law. (laughs) You know, now, you know what I mean? Like, (laughs) it's just, that's going to exist. And that's, that's, that's the other thing that um, is just funny to me. It's that, yeah, if you are raised uh, in an environment and, and you are given your own autonomy and you can develop your sense of self and, and develop your sense of community, you will start caring for people. You will start understanding how things work and you'll understand your own personal code of ethics. And, um, you know, and (laughs) one more reason why government's irrelevant, you know, laws, they don't work and they don't do anything except for give profit to the state. Yeah. And, and basically, you know, start initiate violent conflict where initially there was none um right. and you kind of reminded me of uh you know, you're talking about how laws are irrelevant um or or uh, yeah irrelevant that, that uh, this one uh cartoon of uh you see a, a criminal with a gun and then he's he's like hold on let me check the book and he has a book of of gun laws hold on let me just <laughs> let me check the book first. exactly <laughs> Right. It's like if you, if people are going to commit a crime, they're going to commit a crime regardless of, you know, the the tens of thousands of laws on the in the federal registry which nobody nobody knows at all. Right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and, and the the book the book, you know, when people every time people say, "Well, you got to obey the law. You got to, you know, if it's law, you got to obey." The, I'm like, "Do you know all the laws yourself? Like, have you researched right. all the law? You know, there's a great book right. that I have not read, but I want to by this, uh, I think he's a lawyer, Harvey Silverglade, um, which is entitled uh, Three Felonies a Day. Have you heard of this book? Three- no, but I have heard of him. I, I read an article uh, okay. by him. Yeah, Harvey, yeah. Harvey Sil- oh. Silverglade. Uh, yeah, Three Felonies a Day. Basically how everybody commits three felonies a day. Easily. <laughs> everybody. Right. You know? Right. And the first thing I, I tell people when they tell me, like, you got to obey the law. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> so are you, are you telling me that you... Uh, drive below the speed limit on the highway. Right. right. <laughs> because if you're not, you're a filthy criminal. <laughs> right. And exactly. You should, you should be locked up. <laughs> exactly. So, um, so yeah, <laughs> <laughs> laws and regulations and government and or well, laws and regulations are ridiculous and irrelevant and uh, and do not work. And um, government and statism more more accurately is the belief in authority. You know, I, uh, you know, we like to say that government doesn't exist, but I. You know, I'd rather say it's it's the belief in authority. Like, you know, the people, the IRS, they exist. The buildings, the tanks, all the you know the the, the stealth fighters, stealth bombers, all the, all those exist, right? But it's the right. belief in authority that makes it government. It makes in them the exemption to morality that they can do this stuff. You know, people can go overseas and kill people and not get charged with murder. Right. And if they do it here, they get charged with murder. Like, right. that's an amazing thing. You know. Right. And and people need to realize that. So. Um, so yeah, so, um, you know, I, I kept you for long enough. Uh, <laughs> I know you have to get back to your children, but, uh, That's please right. tell, tell, uh, you know, um, my, uh, my audience a little bit, if you want to finish up with anything before we, uh, before we sign off, if you have any, any last messages for, for the people? Uh, I, I you know, <laughs> I put on the spot, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I just, you know, I'm excited to start this podcast. I'm excited to talk about parenting. I'm excited to be an anarchist. You know, we live in a time where things are really bad 
so what do you have to lose, right? You might as well follow your conscience and you might as well um, lead an example for your children. And I really believe that anarchy is going to save humanity. And if it's not my generation, it'll be some generation. But I really believe that um, the community of anarchists that we have now and, and, and what you're doing with your podcast or the Seeds of Liberty podcast, or I really feel like that's really helping to shift humanity to the next uh, stage that we need to get to that or you know we'll kill each other off so but I, ha I am a little bit more optimistic I'd like to think that um, I'm I, my personal decisions to be an outlaw and to not um, give in to government uh, will enable my children to carry that on and be that themselves so so I've, I've known you for a few months now so my goal is to help you maintain optimism and positivity <laughs> as you <laughs> go to the future actually that's <laughs> You do. I don't know how many times I've emailed you and I went, oh my gosh, Danilo, what's going on? This world is crazy. How am I going to navigate it with my children? And you you always respond with the most even keel, positive message and it's wonderful. So I, I really appreciate that. Yeah. My, and, and my uh, my mother-in-law, she basically says a similar thing, you know, like, uh, you know, we're all slaves and, you know, we, you know how expensive it is to live every day. I, I calculate how expensive it is to live. You know, it's like, it's like, right. man, so much suffering. And, yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and I think that, um, and also even, you know, my, my wife, she's, um, you know, she's, you know, she's close to being an anarchist, not, not, not completely like me, but, but she's more about like, let's just not make too many waves, you know, go along to get along <laughs> that kind of person. Right. And I'm like, and, and the way I look at it is, you know, you know, we have one life and our life is a message, right. To sure. the future, the way you yes. live your life and, um, and everything that we do, any, anything you write, you know, videos you make, podcasts websites blogs um those are snapshots of your thoughts at this particular time right and right, so exactly. and so we should take care what kind of message we're giving to the future right exactly. and so that's why this is so important is we're all leaving our voice and i and that's why i love to do what i do you know so my kids will see in the future you know what i stood for and you know exactly. i can't control what they're going to neither and nor, nor do i want to what they're going to do what they're going to believe but at least they know where I stand. And, exactly. you know, if they want to follow my footsteps, sure, that would be great. But if not, you know, they have their own life. <laughs> sure, uh, exactly. <laughs> so, um, awesome conversation, Melissa. Actually, before we go, I, I like to ask my guests, um, what's your favorite quote of all time? <laughs> it's very simple. It's um, along the lines of how crazy everything is. But my favorite quote of all time is Bill Hicks. Um, it's just a ride. And that's all it is. Like you don't need to worry. You don't freak out. It's, it's going to be okay. You know? Um, so yeah, I, it's just a ride as a mantra that I have very often, uh, throughout the day. So that's definitely one of my favorites. And then actually, uh, there's one part in that quote that I really like where he says, um, um, and then there are people who know that it's just a ride and then they try to tell the other people, Hey, this is just a ride. And you know, and we they, do, you, you know, we, you know what we do to those people, we kill them. Right. <laughs> Right. So I don't say it too loudly. <laughs> I just say it to myself. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is not this is not too loud. This is just going to be broadcast over the YouTube and, you know, Facebook. Right. And, and, <laughs> not too loud. Don't worry about it. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's great. I love Bill Hicks also. And, and I, I have a background in stand up comedy. So, uh, right, you know, George, right. George yeah. Carlin, Bill uh, Hicks. Um, uh, uh, and then there's the less uh, political comedians like uh, Rodney Dangerfield and Emo Phillips that I really look up to. So, um uh, so yeah, that's that. You know, having a background in stand-up comedy also has has helped me to, you know, um, look at the bright side and just take, you know, because I think uh, I forget who said it, but um, comedy is based in tragedy. Like, right. uh, like, like, there's a great quote that I like, which is, um, um, to the people who feel the world is a drama, right. um, and to the um, to the people who think the world is a is a comedy. <laughs> Exactly, <laughs> and I exactly. love that. I love that quote so yep. much. So, so that's kind of how I look at it. But um, but yeah, <laughs> excellent conversation, Melissa. Yep. Thank you very much for coming. Thank on the you show. for having me. Really appreciate thank it. You. So we're looking forward to the new podcast coming up, um, right. and we're going to work on that. Try to get it started as quick as we can. Yes. So uh, if anybody wants to help me out uh, on my show, you can do so through um, Bitcoin, uh, through PayPal, or Patreon. It's patreon.com slash peaceful anarchism to help me out um if you find value in this content please um contribute you know we, we are capitalists in the end and uh you know i love to do this i love to interview interesting people like melissa and i would want to do more 
Um, but, um, you know, monetary compensation is always appreciated and encouraged, right? It's just a feedback mechanism lets me know that you love hearing this stuff. And so uh, <laughs> more encouragement as well. So uh, awesome conversation. Thank you very much. Um, so, this is, you, so this is the Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and the Seeds of Liberty.com and the Conscious Resistance.com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye.